the Macintosh SE30. Launched in 1989, it was arguably the greatest monochrome compact Mac ever made. With its 16 MHz O30 processor, it was several times faster than previous compact Macs. It had a built-in floating point unit, it supported up to 128 megs of RAM, an insane amount at the time, and it was also highly upgradable thanks to its O30 PDS slot. The SC30 was essentially a professional workstation disguised in a compact form factor. I'd been on the lookout for one of these for a while when I finally got hold of one from a local seller at a decent price. But as you'll soon see, I had to jump through a few hoops before I could actually get the thing going. So stay tuned. This particular specimen was sold as untested. Yeah, you can probably guess what that entails. The SC30, like many of its contemporaries, have the unfortunate tendency to self-destruct due to the infamous Maxell lithium battery used to power its real-time clock and PRAM module. And yeah, rusty crumbs immediately spilled out onto my desk as I took the cover off, and signs of corrosion was clearly visible on the frame and RF shielding. And taking the logic board out of the case confirmed the inevitable. Yikes. Looks like a nuke went off in there. Pretty much the entire left side of the logic board had a layer of repulsively putrid battery goop smeared all over it. I began cleaning it off, still somewhat stupidly hopeful that it miraculously hadn't eaten away all the traces underneath. Reality set in soon enough though, and it became clear to even the most fervent optimist that this board was way beyond repair. Perhaps I should have just given up and sold this SC30 for spares at this point, but being the stubborn idiot that I am, I figured that, what the hell, in for a penny, in for a pound, let's build a new logic board for this poor fella. So that's what I did. Thanks to the amazing work of 68K MLA forum member Bolly, you can now get a brand new recreation of the SC30 logic board PCB. It comes with one small caveat though, you have to order it yourself from a PCB manufacturer and then you have to transfer all the chips and components from the dead logic board over to the new one. It takes a bit of work, but with the right tools and some patience, it's not that difficult. Well, okay, by some patience, I mean basically boatloads of patience, but still, it's totally doable. The ordering process was fairly easy. I just fetched the Gerber files off of Bolly's GitHub repo and uploaded them to the order page on JLPCB. Once the files were uploaded, I filled in the correct values and opted to have the back side of the board pre-populated. This is a bit more expensive, but there's a ton of tiny SMDs on the back side, so it's totally worth it, in my opinion. I also noticed that someone on the 68k MLA forum had helpfully created a mouser basket with a bunch of components that are still available as new parts. So I went ahead and ordered that mouser basket too, but I realized later that a big chunk of the components in that basket are actually the stuff that goes on the backside of the PCB that I had already paid to have pre-populated from the factory. So I should have just handpicked some of the stuff from the basket before placing the order, and perhaps added some other stuff instead, such as some F258 and F253 logic chips, which are apparently prone to failure. Well, anyway, while waiting for the new PCBs to arrive from China, I began the process of desoldering components from the old board. I used a combination of hot air, desolder gun, and a regular good old solder iron and desolder braid for this process. For the through hole components, I found it effective to work simultaneously with the hot air and desolder gun, using the hot air to keep the surrounding area hot while working with the gun to suck away all the solder. The heat did cause the PCB to delaminate and deform slightly in some areas, so this may not be the best method if the PCB was going to be reused, but in this case, it was going in the trash anyway, so I don't care. The RAM slots were a bit tricky to get out without breaking the plastic guide pins. I managed to break a few of them unfortunately, but then I found that I could get them out mostly intact if I heated them almost to the point of melting. That made them flexible enough to squeeze through the holes without breaking off. Some of the connection pins got stuck to the PCB and got pulled out, but it was a simple matter of desoldering those separately and putting them back in the slot again. Other than that, it was pretty easy to get all the through hole components out.
The video ROM had some corrosion on its legs, but fortunately it was only surface deep, so some light sanding took care of that. When all the through hole stuff had been taken care of, I turned my attention to the surface mounts on the top side of the board. For these, I used the hot air exclusively and I began by putting flux around the ship I was removing and then circling around it with a hot air nozzle, trying to spread the heat as evenly as possible. Eventually, the chip would come loose and I could lift it away with a tweezer. I used the same procedure for all the surface mount chips on the top side. I highly recommend using one of these chemical respirator thingies for this kind of work. The flux generates a lot of smoke when heated up and there's probably plenty of nasty chemicals from the battery goop in there too. My smoke absorber fan took care of some of it, but not nearly all. When all the chips had been removed, I put them in a plastic container with IPA and let them soak for a while in order to dissolve all the flux I'd added during removal and to get rid of any remaining battery goop that may still be on them. A few weeks later, the pristine new PCBs arrived from the manufacturer. I actually got five of them, as that was the minimum number of units for an order. I'll probably keep a few spares around and try to sell the rest. So then it was time to put everything back on the new board. I started with the large PLCC ICs, i.e. the FPU, glue chips, gassy controller, etc. First I cleaned the legs of the chips by adding a bit of flux and solder to them and then wicking it off again with some solder braid. This left me with nice clean legs that were ready to soak up new solder. Getting them soldered onto the new board was fairly easy. I just put a string of flux on the pads then placed the chips, trying to line it up as perfectly as possible. The flux kind of acts as an adhesive at this point which helps to keep the chip in place. Then I put some solder on the tip of the iron and very carefully held it to one of the corner pins, trying not to nudge the chip out of alignment. Then I did the same to the opposite corner and once two corners were fixed with solder, I double checked the alignment and when I was satisfied that the chip was still straight, I added solder to the rest of the pins by dragging slowly along the legs of the chip with a tin solder iron tip. I checked all the joints as I went along to make sure all the legs were properly soldered. Once all the PLCCs were in place and I felt fairly confident that all the joints were okay, I moved on to the remaining SMDs. The process for the other surface mounted chips were similar to the PLCCs, just add flux, align the chip in place, add solder to the tip and then drag slowly along the legs. As I mentioned earlier, the F258 and F253s are prone to failure on these boards. These are multiplexers used for memory addressing and they easily get damaged by battery goop and cap juice. And in my case, some of the F258s had had their legs entirely corroded away. So I ordered a new set of F258s and scrapped the old ones altogether. Once all the SMDs were in place, I moved on to the through-hole components. These were actually a little bit more finicky than their surface-mounted friends. Many of the legs had gotten slightly bent while the soldering, and it took some patience to align them properly with the holes in the PCB. But once they were in, it was very easy to add the solder. Every once in a while during the assembly process I bathed the entire board in IPA in order to clean off the flux. I kept this large plastic bin filled with IPA under my desk with a lid on it and reused the same IPA throughout the whole process. 
Eventually, I got to the point where I had mounted enough components to try and boot the new board. So I fetched the case and hooked up the board loosely outside of the case, then I flipped the power switch and nothing. No chime, no picture on the CRT. <sighs> Alright, time to start troubleshooting then. My approach to troubleshooting these kinds of things usually starts with staring at the thing stupidly for a while. Let's call it an ocular inspection. And almost immediately I spotted the first thing that was wrong. I'd forgotten to put in the two most obvious capacitors, the two large axial electrolytic caps. Yep, those were the ones I had missed. So I soldered them in and tried again. To my dismay it didn't solve the problem though, still nothing. So I kept going with the ocular inspection, and after a while I noticed that I had put in one of the Sony chips the wrong way around. Well, that was clumsy, but easily fixed. I desoldered the chip and turned it around and tried again to power the machine on. And nope. Still absolutely nothing. Nada. There wasn't really much to do at this point other than keep going. I couldn't find anything else that was obviously wrong, but I saw this post on the forum where someone wrote that they had missed one of the ferrite beads on the underside of the board. So I checked my board and while all the beads were there, I noticed that some of the solder joints looked a little bit weak. So I applied some flux and redid several of those joints. Then I tried to power on again and BAM! Something finally showed up on the CRT. It was broken and garbled, but at least it was a clear sign of life. The garbled mess on the screen appeared to be the floppy icon with the blinking question mark, which would be exactly what I would have expected to see if the board was working. This meant that the ROM, CPU and probably also the RAM was fine. The problem must be somewhere in the video circuitry. And that's exactly where the next part of this unbelievably exciting adventure is gonna kick off. But right now I still have some additional problems to solve and a lot more editing to do. So hit that subscribe button if you want to see where this eventually ends. But until then, thank you so much for watching, take care and see you next time.